Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining. Um, we'll now get started with our webinar today. My name is Isabel Bariga. I'm an engagement specialist for Global Forest Watch and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Today we'll be talking about how to use Global Forest Watch to explore active fires and fire trends over the last 20 years. This webinar is in English and it is going to be interpreted into Spanish, Portuguese, and Bahasa Indonesia. To hear the webinar in another language, please select the interpretation feature in Zoom and select the language that you would like to hear the webinar interpreted in. I'll give people a few minutes to select the language they're interested in hearing the webinar interpreted in. All right, we'll now get started. Um, please proceed to the next slide. So first I'm gonna provide a brief background on Global Forest Watch. Um, so Global Forest Watch, also known as GFW, is an easy to use online forest monitoring platform with global data sourced from satellite imagery combined with contextual data sets. So at GFW, we offer a suite of monitoring tools which are designed to increase knowledge and transparency about forest landscapes, harness information to mobilize local action by governments and civil society, as well as advance private sector action to stop commodity-driven deforestation and manage forests sustainably. Next slide, please. I would love to introduce our speakers to get us started. So our speakers include Michaela Wise. She is a deputy director, director for Global Forest Watch. We're also joined by Sasha Tukavina, who is assist, assistant research professor at University of Maryland. And lastly, we are joined by James McCarthy, who is a research analyst for Global Forest Watch. Next slide. And we have a great webinar lined up today. So here's our agenda. We're gonna start by providing an overview of the impacts and types of wildfires. And then we'll dive deeper into the fire data on GFW and discuss how you can use it to monitor active fires and trends. We'll wrap up the discussion with some information about potential data limitations and open the floor up for questions. To ask a question, please type it in the Q&A box in Zoom. We'll be monitoring your questions and comments throughout the webinar. I also wanted to note that this webinar is being recorded. So everyone who registered for the webinar today will receive a copy of the recording as well as the slides from today's webinar. With that, I'll now hand off to Michaela to provide an overview of the fire impacts and types. Great, thank you so much, Isabella, and thank you all for joining. Uh, next slide, please. So we're here today to talk about fires, which are a very critical and timely issue. And you may have seen some new research from the University of Maryland that Sasha will talk about in just a second, looking at tree cover loss due to fires that showed us that forest fires have gotten quite a bit worse over the past 20 years. And in fact, we see that forest fires are causing twice as much tree cover loss today as they were 20 years ago. 2021 in particular was a very uh, dramatic year for, for forest fires, one of the worst on record, burning an area of tree cover about the size of Portugal. Next slide, please. And we also know that forest fires account for more than a quarter of the total global tree cover loss that we see uh, in the data on Global Forest Watch. So really understanding how wildfire dynamics are playing out is critical in order to understand what is happening to forests around the world. And I think these statistics are not necessarily that surprising for those who regularly follow fire events on the news. It seems like there's always something that is popping up in our news feeds from, you know, Cal uh, California and West Coast fires happening today, uh, dramatic fires in Europe over the summer, unprecedented fires in Siberia in 2021, and these big fire events in other parts of the world, such as in Indonesia in 2015, the Brazilian Amazon in 2019, and Australia in 2019, 2020. So I think really being able to parse through the data and understand the trends over time, how things compare to previous time periods and understanding where fires are happening right now it is a really critical part to understanding some of these stories. And that's exactly the point of today's webinar. Next slide, please. So why do we care about fires? 
I think probably all of us have our own reasons that we're here today and, and interested in this webinar, uh, but just broadly, some of the ways that we see fires impacting the world uh, are through these three areas. So on environment, we see emissions when vegetation burns uh, that can result in climate change, impacts on biodiversity and the resilience of ecosystems, especially those that are not very well adapted to fires. Uh, we can also see flooding and landslide impacts as a result as well. On the health side, we know that smoke and haze from wildfires can lead to problems with air quality. And in fact, something like 30,000 people a year are dying from comp health complications related to wildfire smoke. And then finally, there are economic reasons as well particularly when fires are causing direct damage to infrastructure, but also disruptions that can happen to global supply chains. Next slide. And here at WRI, we're especially interested in the, this interaction between fires and climate change. And those two interact in a way that causes this positive feedback loop shown on the slide. So when we have increasing carbon emissions, fueling climate change, that leads to hotter and drier conditions and makes forests and other ecosystems more prone to fires. Then those areas burn more and more intensely, more frequently, which leads to an increase in the carbon emissions uh, from the vegetation that has burned, which then again feeds into these changing climatic conditions. So really this interaction between those two factors we think is a, a big part of why we see this increase in tree cover loss due to fires over the past 20 years. Next slide. Before we get into some of the data, I also just wanted to take a second to talk a little bit about uh, wildfires and some of the types of fires that we see. So although some fires are set intentionally and are managed um, to meet different landscape management objectives. Primarily what we're talking about today are wildfires, which are generally unplanned fires that are set either by natural causes like lightning or from accidental human ignition. For example, escaped agricultural fires uh, or from recreation or in some cases even arson. But I think it's important to keep in mind that wildfires are not necessarily always a bad thing. And in fact, some ecosystems such as boreal forests and grasslands are actually adapted to fire conditions and, and thrive uh, when fires happen at a, a kind of regular or, or normal interval and intensity. The times when we're worried about wildfires is when they are happening much more often or much more intensely than is uh, part of the, the kind of normal fire regime or when they're happening in places like humid tropical forests where uh, the ecosystem is not so well adapted to those fire impacts. So I think that's a big part of what you can get from Global Forest Watch as well as an understanding of how the fire dynamics that we see at the present moment compare to uh, earlier points in time. Next slide, please. All right, so starting to look at the data, um, this table just presents the various layers that we have on fires on the Global Forest Watch platform. And we are gonna go through the, each of these in a little bit more detail, but I just wanted to denote some of the different types of data that we host. So on the top rows, we have our fire activity data, which is really about looking at the, the extent of fires either right now or over historic periods of time and understanding where burning is happening within specific areas that you might be interested in. And then the bottom two rows are our contextual data sets, which give a bit more uh, nuance and understanding, uh, especially when paired with that fire activity data, for example, about the risk of fire activity, as well as some of the impacts in terms of air quality. Um, we're not going to go through this all this table right now, but I do also just want to point out that all of these different data sets have different trade-offs in terms of their resolution, how often they're updated, the time period that they cover. And so really there's not one best data set out of any of these. They really each have their own best use, which is something that we'll be talking about throughout the course of today's webinar. 
So with that, I am going to pass it off to Sasha to talk about the, the first data set in this list, the tree cover loss from fires. Over to you, Sasha. Thank you, Michaela. And somebody already asked uh, whether the data we're talking about is um, only in the tropics. No, it's global. All the data sets that are shown on this uh, table are global. Next slide, please. So this is the new data set um, produced by our uh, lab at UMD, GLAD lab. Um, basically, it provides context to our uh, tree cover loss data, global tree cover loss data, to um, start attributing some of the drivers of forest loss. So you can see the map on the right. Uh, it only shows, for now, fire-related tree cover loss versus all uh, other loss drivers, which could be like clearing of forest for pasture, cropland, forestry operations, lo logging, and so on. So we don't distinguish, distinguish between all these other drivers of forest loss for now. We just say whether it was lost due to fire or other drivers. And um, our definition of uh, tree cover loss due to fire includes um, intentionally set fires, uh, as well as accidental fires, for example, ex escaped fires from uh, various agricultural activities. And we only call it tree cover loss due to fire when trees die directly from, from burning, from the fire. So for example, very often during the process of convert, um, converting forests to other land uses like pasture, cropland, or during uh, shifting cultivation practices, trees are cut down first and then piled up and burned. Uh, this we, we won't call tree cover loss due to fire because the initial driver uh, of uh, tree cover loss for us would be mechanical removal of trees. Um, so this new data set um, is, uh, has the same time span as the global uh, tree cover loss data, 2001 to 2021, which allows us to look at uh, uh, trends like Mikhail already mentioned. And we're gonna, uh, gonna update uh, this data set annually together with the tree cover loss data. Next slide. So this is um, an image with country level stats from the original paper covers only the first 19 years of the time period. Uh, but from, from the map on the left, you can see that we see increasing trends of tree cover loss uh, due to fire um, throughout the um, tropical Latin America and um, Central Africa. There, uh, we didn't observe a trend in Indonesia, uh, but in general in the tropics, um, a lot of the countries exhibit the, those um, increasing trends. Um, as well as uh, Russia. So in, in, in boreal Eurasia, we see an increasing uh, trend of tree cover loss due to fire. Uh, we did observe um, a decrease in trend only in three countries, United Kingdom, Kazakhstan, and China, but in these countries, there is not a lot of tree cover loss due to fire to begin with. And as you can see um, from the graphs on the top right and bottom left, um, Russia and Canada contributed um, most of the tree cover loss due to fire in the study period, but also Australia had significant um, tree cover loss due to fire um, in 2019 and 2020, about 20% 20 of their um, temperate broadleaf forests uh, burned, which was, which was really unusual for that biome. Next slide. And then um, earlier this year, we updated the data set to include um, 2020 and 2021 and um, my colleagues at WRI, Jimmy and his team uh, ran updated stats on the data. And uh, we found that um, 2020 and 2021 continue to be high uh, tree cover loss due to fire years, especially in the boreal Eurasia again in Russia, 2021 was an extreme uh, fire year in the forest, but also in the tropics, um, the rates of tree cover loss due to fire didn't really drop below um, pre-2015 level, so they're still remaining high, and as well as um, the global uh, trend of tree cover loss due to fire remains increasing. With that, I will hand it off to Jimmy to talk about um, uh, the ways to analyze these data in uh, Global Forest Watch and other um, fire data types that are available from the, pl from the platform. Thank you. Great, thank you, Sasha. Um, as Sasha mentioned, I prepared a video that'll show you how to interact with and analyze the tree cover loss due to fires data on the GFW map. Um, we'll go over how to analyze this data on the dashboard a little bit later, um, but for now, uh, you can go ahead and press play on this. Let's start by looking at the different fire data layers on the map. 
open a web browser and navigate to globalforestwatch.org and then click the map link. If this is the first time you're visiting the website, you may see a window with some tutorials on how to use Global Forest Watch. Feel free to visit these tutorials in your own time or visit the Help Center for more information. For now, I'm just going to click on the X in the top right corner to close the window. As you'll see, the map will start with several data layers already loaded. These are tree cover extent, tree cover loss, and tree cover gain. Because we are primarily interested in the fire data, I'm going to go ahead and remove each of these layers by clicking on the X in the top right corner. All of the fire data can be found in the Forest Change tab under the Fires heading. As we talked about earlier, there are five fire data layers available for visualization. You can click on the I button next to any of the data layers to see more information about that data layer. Let's start with the newest data layer, tree cover loss due to fires. If we click on the I button for the tree cover loss due to fires data, we can see more information about that layer. This information includes a description of what the data can be used for, the spatial resolution, geographic coverage, data source, update frequency, years included in the data, as well as some potential limitations. There is also an overview of the data with some additional information about how the data is produced and what it shows. We recommend users read this information for each data set of interest. Return to the map by exiting out of the information window by clicking on the X in the top right corner. Turn on the tree cover loss due to fires layer by clicking the toggle button for that layer. Collapse the layer selection window by clicking on the forest change tab again. We can now see tree cover loss due to fires data on the map in brown. We can adjust the opacity of this and any other layer using the opacity slider in the top right corner. I'll keep it at 100% for now. You can also adjust the time period that is visualized using the date slider at the bottom of the legend. Let's keep it at the full 21 years for now. Let's explore this data a little more by taking a look at an example in Australia. We can click on the play button to view an animation of tree cover loss due to fires across all 21 years of data. From this animation, we can see that the record-breaking fires that occurred in 2019 and 2020 caused a substantial amount of tree cover loss, especially in the eastern part of the country. Before we calculate tree cover loss statistics, it is important to note that we show tree cover loss due to fires in areas where tree canopy density is greater than 30% by default. This means that 30% of each loss pixel is covered by trees. Different threshold levels may be more appropriate for specific countries and regions, but we generally assess global tree cover loss using tree canopy threshold of 30% and recommend it for most use cases. We can see how much of a difference the threshold selection makes by changing the tree canopy threshold from 30% to 10%. Although it is difficult to see, there is a small increase in the total amount of tree cover loss due to fires especially in the southwest of the country, where trees are relatively sparse and the dominant land cover is shrubs. The difference in tree cover loss is much more obvious when we use a higher threshold for tree canopy density, like 75%. In this case, almost all of the fire-related tree cover loss in the southwest of the country disappears. I'll change the threshold back to 30% for now and use that for all future analysis. Now that we have selected a tree canopy threshold for tree cover loss, we can figure out how much fire-related tree cover loss occurred in New South Wales, an area that was hit especially hard by the 2019 and 2020 wildfires. Click on the region and then click the Analyze button. The analysis window on the left shows the results of the analysis for all of the data layers currently visualized on the map. If we scroll down, 
we can see that fire was responsible for more than 2 million hectares of tree cover loss over the past 21 years. We can also see that 2020 had the highest amount of fire-related tree cover loss with about 1 million hectares lost to fires, or about 80% of all tree cover loss for that year. The chart on the bottom shows that wildfires are a major driver of deforestation in Australia, with three quarters of all tree cover loss due to fires during that time period. The remaining 25% due to other drivers of loss. This kind of analysis can be repeated for other administrative areas or specific areas of interest like protected areas, but we do not have enough time to cover those features today. We plan on holding office hours and additional webinars that dive deeper into our fire data in the future. So be sure to join our newsletter so you don't miss out. Great. Uh, I think that's all for that one. You can go ahead and advance the slides, please. Great. In addition to the new tree cover loss from fires data, we also offer burned area data uh, that's collected by the MODA sensor on board the Terra and Aqua satellites. In contrast to the tree cover loss from fires data that we just demonstrated, uh, which only shows the burned areas in forest ecosystems, the MODIS data shows burned areas across all land cover types. The data set provides coarse 500 meter resolution information on long term trends in fire extent and includes low intensity fires and fires used to clear land. Uh, while the data is updated monthly, data can be delayed by up to three months. Um, so if you go to the website now and look for data, it'll be a three month delay from when the fires actually occurred. Uh, you can go ahead and move to the next slide. This is just a comparison of the new tree cover loss due to fires data compared to the MODIS data. You can see that the resolution is much higher um, in the new tree cover loss due to fires data. Um, both of these areas are well suited for calculating burned areas, but the finer spatial resolution of the tree cover loss from fires data provides more accurate area calculations. Um, the one other thing to note about these two data sets is that the NASA has indicated that the satellites carrying the MODIS sensor will be decommissioned later this year. And while the satellites will continue to provide data for several more years, support will be limited going forward. So the tree cover loss due to fires data um, will continue to be updated on an annual basis. Um, so it might be more useful for detecting and analyzing uh, trends in tree cover loss due to fires. Uh, next slide. Um, another type of fire data that we have available are the active fire alerts. Um, and these are available for both MODIS and VIRS uh, satellite sensors. Uh, the data from MODIS is available at 500 meter resolution and has data going back to 2000, while the VIRS data has a spatial resolution of 375 and has data going back to 2012. Um, both of these data sets are considered near real time. They're updated twice a day and can be used to detect ongoing and active fires. Uh, like the MODIS burned area data set, these alerts are across all land cover types. So it's not just in forests. Um, in addition to forest fires, they also capture low intensity fires, grassland fires, and fires used to clear land. Um, so you'll have to take care if you're trying to distinguish between managed fires and wildfires. If you're interested in getting the fire alerts for specific areas of interest delivered by email, you can sign up to receive notifications in your MyGFW account, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Um, just a little bit more information about these fire alerts. Um, their detection depends on the fire size and intensity, um, the land cover type where the fire is occurring, the time of day, and whether or not clouds or haze are present. Um, fires as small as about 100 square meters can be detected with the VIRS active fire alerts, but whether the fire is ultimately depended, depends on those factors, or detected depends on those factors. Um, larger, hotter fires are typically easier to detect, especially at night 
when they occur in forest ecosystems. Um, and each fire alert is assigned a confidence level to help users filter out potential false positives that are caused by sun reflecting off of clouds, rivers, or metal roofs, um, which can sometimes confuse the sensors. Um, each alert represents the center point of a pixel where the fire was detected. So one pixel does not necessarily equal one fire. Um, as you can see in the image on the right here, some fires might be smaller than a single pixel. So you could have multiple fires in a single pixel. Um, on the other hand, you might have one fire that spans multiple pixels. So you'll pick up multiple fire alerts for one fire. Uh, in addition, um, a single fire can be detected multiple times if the same fire is still burning when the satellite passes overhead the next day. So for these reasons, fire alerts are not necessarily a good indication of burned area and should not be used for burned area calculations. It's much better to use the burned area data or the tree cover loss due to fires for those use cases. Uh, next slide. To provide users with more information about fire risk and impacts, GFW also hosts two data sets to complement the fire activity data. Michaela already introduced these. Um, they're contextual data sets that offer a little bit more information uh, about uh, fire risk and air quality. Um, so the first one is the Global Fire Weather Index, which is a coarse 10 kilometer data set that provides information on fire danger. It can be used to identify areas where climate conditions make landscapes more vulnerable to fires. And so it allows users to understand the current risk of burning and whether an active fire is likely to spread. Um, this data is derived from a number of different climate variables, including daily precipitation, temperature, relative humidity, wind speed, snow depth. Um, and this data is updated on a daily basis. Um, so you can get up-to-date forecasts on what the fire danger looks like for areas globally. Uh, go ahead, next slide. The other contextual data set that we offer is the air quality index. Um, this index is strongly impacted by smoke and haze from wildfires and allows you to visualize data from more than 15,000 stations worldwide. Um, this data is available just for specific stations. So it won't be, it does have global coverage, but you won't see kind of a continuous coverage like you do with the fire data, or sorry, the fire weather index. Um, but there are stations globally, so you can still get an idea of how fires are impacting um, air quality. The data is updated every 15 minutes and is only available, like I said, where air quality data is available. Um, the data, help users understand where fires may be impacting public health. Um, so local governments or communities can um, identify ways to provide relief. Um, the index scale goes from zero to, I think it goes maximum of 500. Um, but basically the uh, legend here tells you kind of what levels of air quality um, correspond with kind of the health impacts that you can expect to see. Um, go ahead to next slide, please. Um, now that you've seen all the data that we have available on Global Forest Watch, I'm going to go through, I've recorded another video to walk you through how to use the dashboard on our website to help identify trends and insights um, using that tool. Uh, go ahead and press play. Let's take a look at the dashboard. Open a web browser and navigate to globalforestwatch.org. Click on the dashboard link at the top of the website. The first thing you'll see when you visit the dashboard is a summary of statistics for the whole world. If you scroll down, you can see that this page has a bunch of information about tree cover loss, drivers of deforestation, tree cover gain, and tree cover extent. We're interested in fires, so I'll scroll back up and click on the fires tab. On this page, we can easily see how much tree cover was lost over the past 20 years and how much of that loss was due to wildfires compared to other drivers of loss. Over the past 20 years, 119 million hectares of tree cover was lost due to fires, 
That's an area roughly the size of Ethiopia here. The year with the most tree cover loss due to fires was 2016, with more than nine and a half million hectares of fire related loss. That's about a third of all tree cover loss for that year. There are a few different ways you can interact with this chart. First, if you hover your mouse over each bar, you can see how much tree cover was lost that year and how much was due to fires compared to other drivers. For example, we can see here in 2013 that 20.6 20 million hectares of tree cover loss occurred with about 7 million of that due to tree cover loss from fires. You can also filter the data by clicking on the gear icon in the top right corner. As an example, let's take a look at the data for primary forests. Go ahead and click the drop down menu for forest type and select primary forests. You can also select a different land category as well, such as keep out diversity areas, logging concessions, protected areas, or change the years that you're interested in looking at, as well as the canopy density. We'll go ahead and leave those the same for now and then exit out of the settings window by clicking the gear icon again. Similar to the global trends we saw for all forest types, it looks like 2016 had the highest amount of forest lost due to fires. It also looks like the past few years have seen higher annual rates of tree cover loss than the previous decade. We can dig deeper into the data to try and confirm that observation by clicking on the download button in the top right corner. You should see it load in the bottom of your screen. We won't go into how to analyze the data offline in this webinar, but stay tuned for future webinars where we take a deeper dive into the fire data and cover some simple analyses you can do with the downloaded data. Let's clear the download bar at the bottom of the screen for now. You can also view more information about this data by clicking the I button in the top right corner. Let's close this window for now, but we encourage you to take a look as you explore the website. You can also share this data or embed it in a website by clicking on the share button in the top right corner. You can either copy and paste the link or click on the Twitter or Facebook buttons for easy sharing. You can also embed this chart in a website by clicking on the embed button and then copy and pasting the HTML text into your website. We won't cover that here, so let's close the sharing window for now and take a look at some of the other charts on this page. The next chart down shows which countries have unusually high burned areas for this time of year. The chart uses data from the MODIS burned area layer we discussed earlier. Since the data can be delayed for up to three months, I usually find it's better to use the fire alert data. We can switch to the fire alert data in the settings window. As you can see, we have a few options here as well. You can choose to view different data sets using this drop down menu, or you can choose the unit of measurement to rank different countries by. You can also choose how much data is visualized at one time. Let's go ahead and select the Beers fire alerts for now. It looks like Equatorial Guinea and Jordan are experiencing some abnormal fire activity for this time of year. Let's take a look at which country has the highest number of alerts over the past four weeks. We'll open the settings again, and you'll notice now that we've selected the Beers fire alerts, we actually have a confidence level option. You can either view all alerts or only the high confidence ones. We'll go ahead and leave it as high confidence level for now. We'll also adjust the unit from significance to total alerts. And then we'll close the settings. It looks like Brazil is the country with the highest number of alerts with more than a quarter of all alerts globally over the past four weeks. The last two charts are based on the tree cover loss due to fires data. Similar to the previous chart, the first one here allows you to rank countries by the annual rate of tree cover loss. Here we see Russia, Canada and the United States rank the highest. You can also view this data based on the proportion of fire related loss compared to all tree cover loss in the settings menu here. We'll go ahead and leave it as hectares for now. Lastly, we can see fire related tree cover loss as a proportion of all tree cover loss over the entire time period. Looking at this chart, we can confirm that tree cover loss from fires is responsible for more than a quarter of all tree cover loss. Similar to the other charts, we can adjust the settings by clicking on the gear icon. 
Let's look at the last five years of data from 2017 to 2021. I'll just select 2017 from the drop down menu and then close the setting window. We can see now that fires were responsible for a greater proportion of tree cover loss in recent years compared to the entire 20 year period. Instead of a quarter of all tree cover loss, forest fires were responsible for almost a third of all tree cover loss over the past five years. Being able to view these statistics at a global level yields important trends, but it's often more useful to drill down into the data and view statistics for an individual countries, regions, or even districts. We can do that a couple different ways. We can either click on the country name in either of the ranking widgets, or we can type it at the top of the page. Let's do that now for Brazil, which had the highest number of fire alerts. At the country level, we see a couple more charts that weren't available at the global level. The first chart shows the number of weekly fire alerts and compares that data to historical trends for the country. It also uses those historical trends to identify when peak fire season typically occurs in Brazil. In this case, fire season usually begins in early August and lasts about 13 weeks, meaning we are right in the middle of peak fire season, which explains why the number of fire alerts are so high. Looking at this chart, we can also see that the number of fire alerts last week were abnormally high, but have now returned to normal levels. We can also compare the current data to previous years like 2020, which was one of the worst fire seasons on record. We can click here to add a new year and select 2020 from the drop down menu. We can click off of the settings menu to make it disappear. Based on this chart, it looks like the fire season is off to a pretty similar start compared to 2020. If we scroll down, we see the chart showing annual tree cover loss due to fires for Brazil, as well as a news chart that shows cumulative burned area. Again, the data is a few months old, so I find it more useful to look at the alert data. Go ahead and select VIRS alerts again from the settings menu. Let's also add 2020 here so we can compare it to that year. Despite the unusually high activity last week, it looks like the number of fire alerts this year are within the normal range of fire activity for this time of year and lag behind 2020. Continuing down the page, we see the ranking chart again. This time it shows which regions in Brazil have the most fire alerts rather than countries. We've already covered that chart previously, so I'll keep scrolling down for now. The next chart shows historical data on the number of weekly fire alerts going back to 2012 when the VIRS sensor was launched into space. We can see a clear pattern indicating peak fire season months here. If we keep scrolling down, we see one more new chart that shows how many of the fire alerts in the past week were high confidence compared to all other alerts. From this data, we can see we've been filtering out about half the alerts in our analysis. That's all I'm able to cover today, but we encourage you to explore the site on your own time and explore fire trends in your specific areas of interest. Please feel free to reach out with any questions as you explore the site further. All right, I think that's all for that video. Um, next slide, great. Um, so there are two other features on the website that I didn't get a chance to mention, but I'll try to quickly cover those here. Uh, in addition to analyzing the data by different administrative levels, you can also choose specific areas of interest or create your own custom dashboards. As an example, I added the protected areas layer here, as well as the active fire alerts data. Um, you can use almost any layer of, of data though on our website and get uh, statistics. Um, clicking on the protected area shows a pop-up window with some additional information about the protected area and also gives you the option to analyze data within the park. Um, there's also an option to draw your own area or upload your own shapefile for analysis if you look in the top left corner. Uh, next slide, please. Clicking the Analyze button brings up the statistics on the left side of the screen uh, for that specific area similar to what you saw for the tree cover loss from fires data that we analyzed earlier in the webinar. You also see at the bottom of the screen that you can save the area to your MyGFW account.
Clicking on the button will prompt you to log into your GFW account if you are not already logged in. Next slide. If you don't already have an account, you can sign up for one here using your email, Twitter, Facebook, or Google account. Next slide. Once you are logged in, you will be able to save the area to your account. Uh, you can add a name for the area and tags to easily organize and group your areas. You can also provide your email address and sign up to receive fire or forest change alerts as soon as they are detected or re just receive a summary of alerts at the end of the month. Um, the, what we mean by fire alerts here are the beers alerts, you'll get a count of them on a daily basis um, or monthly, depending on what you select. Um, you can also select your language preference and choose whether you want to make the area public or private. Um, private areas can only be viewed by the area's create, creator, whereas public uh, areas can be shared with other people outside of the person's account. Uh, next slide. After you save the area, it'll now be accessible through the map or dashboard. And the new area will have its own dashboard page with all the same statistics and information as the dashboard we covered earlier. Um, but this will all be specific to your custom area of interest. Um, next slide. Uh, so that covers all of the data. But as you've seen today, uh, GFW offers a robust suite of fire data on the platform. Uh, the goal of this webinar was to introduce you to our fire data so you can harness this information to mobilize local action. Uh, for example, the tree cover loss due to fires and burned area data can be used to identify areas that have burned recently and target those areas for restoration. Likewise, users can use the dashboard to identify areas that are experiencing unusual fire activity or sign up to receive notifications when fires are detected in a protected area or other areas of interest so they can quickly respond before fires grow out of control. I'm sure there's a number of use cases that you all will identify as you kind of explore the data. Um, one re organization recently used the fire alerts to um, identify indigenous areas that were most impacted by wildfires with the goal of increasing support to volunteer fire brigades in those areas. Um, so after this webinar, we hope that you'll find your own use cases and keep in touch to let us know how you're using the data um, and have a better understanding of how you can use each data type. Um, just one last slide before the question and answer section. Um, I just wanted to note that we are not the only platform with fire data. We put a lot of effort into making our platform as user-friendly as possible, but recognize that each user comes with their own unique needs so we want to make sure that you're aware of other platforms that might also help. Um, one of those platforms is Firecast, which Conservation International built to provide timely information on fires and forest disturbances to local stakeholders in the Amazon, Madagascar, and Indonesia. It aggregates fire data from NASA, as well as forest disturbance alerts from Global Forest Watch, and provides the information to users via email and text alerts for custom areas of interest. The Global Wildfire Information System is a collaborative effort between the European Space Agency and NASA and provides a variety of fire data, including near real time fire alerts, national level statistics, and long term fire weather forecasts. The last fire data platform I'll mention is the Global Fire Emissions Database, which provides emission estimates from fires for a variety of atmospheric gases, including carbon dioxide and methane. We're always looking for ways to improve our platform. So please let us know if there are any data or features on any of these other platforms that you would like to see on GFW. I'll go ahead and pass it back to Isabella now for the question and answer session, but thank you all so much for joining today. Looking forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Jimmy, for, and thanks to all the speakers for a great presentation. So now we'll have some time for a few questions from the audience. As a reminder to submit a question, please use the Q&A button in Zoom uh, to send us your questions or comments. We've already been receiving a few questions that we've answered uh, via the chat, but I have a few um, already prepared here. So from Alexandra Thompson, she asked a question, is the percent 
a canopy density option referring to A, percent of canopy that is lost due to fire, or B, fire lost in forested areas with originally more than percent canopy. Um, Michaela, would you like to answer this question? Sure, I'm happy to take that. So yeah, on Global Forest Watch, all of the tree cover loss data, and so by the same means, the tree cover loss due to fire data, um, you can set your percent canopy density that you want as a, a initial threshold. That is referring to the canopy density in the year 2000. So it's a baseline. Basically, it's letting you adjust you know, what you consider as a forested area. I think different countries have different definitions and for different purposes, you might be interested in uh, denser or more sparse forest, depending on the type of area that you're looking at. Great, thank you. Um, we also have another question from the audience. Um, is there a way to differentiate between wildfires and fires for management purposes on GFW at the landscape level? Jimmy, would you like to answer this question? Sure. Um, so I think actually this is what's really exciting about the tree cover loss from fires data is that does kind of help to identify areas that are specifically where there's been tree cover loss due to wildfires. Um, we don't necessarily have a layer that identifies fires that are from management actions. Um, so I think that would be probably your best I guess use um, is to use that data to identify wildfires and forests. Um, yeah, I think there are other ways that you can potentially use. We've got um, some planet imagery that you can use on our website to kind of look at uh, kind of, I guess, monthly mosaics of cloud-free imagery to kind of identify whether wildfire, whether it's kind of a more intense wildfire. Um, but yeah, I think that the best way to differentiate between wildfires and fires for management would probably be to use the tree cover loss due to fires data. Great. Um, I have another uh, comment uh, slash question from Michael Penn. That's a great presentation. Thank you. And he has three questions. Um, the first one being annual tree cover loss that James showed for Australia is really great. Can we see a global level analysis? Additionally, can the time series for a global country level be downloaded? And lastly, are there any daily time series data either for global or on a country level that we can download? Uh, I'll hand this off uh, to Jimmy, if you'd like to take this one. Sure, so the annual tree cover loss data, I think we kind of covered this in the last video we just showed, um, but yes, you can view global trends, you can download the global data as well as the country data using that download button in the top right corner of each of the charts on the dashboard. Um, and then the last question was about any daily time series. Um, so we do make some of, I guess the finest detail that we have would be the VIRS fire alerts. Um, those are aggregated on a weekly level, although you can actually download the like actual individual um, fire alert points in the dashboard, um, which potentially we can maybe dive into in, in office hours um, or later webinar. But it only allows you to download, I think it's like 5,000 records or something like that. But that would be kind of the finest level of resolution that you can get would be the individual alerts. But I guess Great. I should just also add, sorry. Um, the, the burned area data is on a monthly basis and actually, yeah, the burned area data is offered on a monthly basis and the tree cover loss due to fires data is offered on an annual basis. Great. Um, thanks so much, Jimmy. We also received a question from Grayson Fuller. Uh, thank you for this extremely interesting webinar. Um, he noticed that GFW doesn't consider forest fires as a permanent driver of forest loss, um, supposing that because these ecosystems normally recover well from fires, given the positive loop that Michaela mentioned about global warming and fire occurrence frequency 
He's wondering if we should start to consider fires as semi-permanent or permanent drivers of tree cover loss. And any insight on this would be really appreciated. Uh, Sasha, would you like to answer this question? Sure. So I think um, the issue here is not how uh, what we consider, um, whether we consider tree cover loss due to fire permanent or not, is how tree cover loss is defined in our global map. So for now, we only define the first tree cover loss. We identify the first tree cover loss event that happened between 2001 and 2021. And we only have tree cover gain for the first 12 years of the period. So even in the areas like, for example, shifting cultivation, we would only um, identify the first clearing, even though in many uh, tropical areas, forests regrow within five to seven years, and then are cut down back or left to regrow. So uh, if the pixel is identified as tree cover loss in our 30 meter map, it doesn't mean that this is, this is permanent tree cover loss. Same with, with fire. So here we only attribute this particular pixel of tree cover loss to fire or other driver. Um, maybe in some of these cases, not all the canopy died. It was just like some, somebody pointed out the eucalyptus uh, forests in Australia that they, they typically don't die. So uh, once we have an updated version of the global tree cover loss uh, and gain product uh, in, sometime in the future uh, where it shows annual tree cover losses and gains, we would be able to actually track those recoveries and uh, provide a, a more a robust picture of what is happening in the ecosystems. For example, in many cases, like in Brazil, um, forests are just like heavily selectively logged and then become more vulnerable to fires. And then one fire happens in another fire and eventually you lose all um, tree canopy, but not uh, necessarily after, after the first fire. So I agree with you that for now it lacks this, this important detail. Thanks so much, Sasha. Um... We also have another question related to what could explain uh, the 2016 fire uh, spike in the tropics, which was uh, indicated in the picture that we showed earlier in the presentation. Sasha, would you also like to address this question? Sure. So I think it was mostly related to El Nino drier conditions in those uh, tropical forests where fires are not uh, normally occurring. And Again, we saw a lot of these fires happen in already degraded forests, uh, like in Brazil and the southern Brazilian Amazon, which were previously logged. Um, and but we also saw some some uh, large fires in Central Africa, like in the Republic of the Congo. There were huge fires in 2016, where normally fires just um, forest fires just don't happen because of the dry conditions related to El Nino. Thank you. Um, it's really helpful and. We received a question um, regarding definitions that we provided at the beginning of the webinar, which indicates that only forest trees lost directly uh, from fires are in the data setup. Um, and that supposing that this means both shifting cultivation and burning of agriculture crop uh, debris, even if it's located within forest lands, are these both excluded? Um, Perhaps, um, Sasha, if you would like to talk about the tree cover loss from fire data, and then maybe, Jimmy, if you want to add on about any other fire later layers, um, would you like to take on this question first, Sasha? Yeah, sure. Uh, so you're right. Um, in our definition of tree cover loss due to fire, shift in cultivation would, will not be identified as um, tree cover loss due to fire, because like I said, uh, you, normally in shifting cultivation, trees are cut down first and dried, then filed and burned. So in this case, uh, we consider it uh, to be the uh, mechanical removal of trees as a uh, primary driver. And burning of agricultural crop uh, debris will not be, will not in most cases lead to um, tree cover loss. So we don't um, detect it in the global tree cover loss map and we don't um, attribute it to loss due to fire. There are some escaped fires from um, uh, agricultural burning and we'll see them um, as uh, forest fires, as tree cover loss. Yeah, and I think just to add to that, the, uh, the burned area data would pick up those agricultural fires, the modus burned area data um, picks up those fires as well as the active fire data from beers and modus. Great, thank you so much. Um, we received another question um, 
regarding why or um, why Global Forest Watch fires integrating to the main GFW platform. Is this related to a request from uh, the Indonesian government through the Ministry of Forestry and Environment? Uh, Michaela, would you like to expand on this question? Sure. So yeah, the question is referring to a, a platform that we previously had uh, linked to Global Forest Watch called Global Forest Watch Fires that specifically looked at this topic and, and had functionality basically to track fire alerts. Um, really, that was a, a very practical decision on our part. Um, so just over the almost 10 years now that Global Forest Watch has been in operation, we've learned that it's quite expensive to maintain all of these different platforms, right? And so the the costs of maintaining a separate Global Forest Watch fires platform um, from the main Global Forest Watch website were just too great to justify. And we really were realizing that many of the same people who were using the Global Forest Watch fires website were also interested in other data sets on Global Forest Watch. And so um, I don't know exactly how long ago, but maybe four years, something like that, we decided to bring in all of these fire layers directly to the Global Forest Watch platform. So many of the ones that we presented on today, the active fires, burned areas, air quality, um, we migrated to the Global Forest Watch website. We set up the subscription notifications there. We set up all of the dashboard um, graphs that, that Jimmy showed so that basically all of the same functionality exists as was on Global Forest Watch fires, but it's a little bit easier for us to maintain and it's easier, you know, you don't have to go to a separate website. But um, certainly, you know, if there's particular functionality from that site that, you know, you used a number of years ago and, and would be interesting or you think is missing, um, always happy to hear that feedback and think about how we can improve things. Great, thank you, Michaela. Um, we also received another question um, because it was mentioned earlier that the virus fire alerts could be picked up multiple times if the same fire country, if the same, excuse me, if the same fire continues over multiple days, is the total number of fire alerts adjusted at all uh, for these repeat alerts or are these pixels simply counted twice? Jimmy, would you like to take on this question? And this will be uh, our last question um, before we conclude the webinar. Sure, um, so in answer to the question, essentially, yeah, the pixels are counted twice. We don't do any kind of adjustment to account for the fact that there might be multiple pickups of the same fire. Um, so that is something to keep in mind as you're going through and analyzing the data um, that it's difficult to necessarily look at trends in the number of fires um, year to year with this data because um, yeah, like I said, you might be picking up one fire and picking up multiple fires. Um, I think it does give you a sense of kind of general fire activity though. So it can still be useful to look at kind of how things are progressing over time. Great, thank you. And thank you to all our speakers for, for addressing these questions. And thank you to our audience for sending um, these really interesting questions. If we didn't have time to address your question, please feel free to follow up with us via email. Our email is gfw at wri.org. I'll include this in the chat. And just a few reminders, we're at time. So um, before we close, you'll notice that a survey will pop up on your screen. So please complete the survey uh, there's a few questions regarding how the webinar was conducted and your reactions to the fire day that we covered. And your feedback is really critical to helping us improve future webinars as well as GFW's offering. So thank you all for joining and stay tuned. We're going to have office hours in October. I will include the link in the chat. Um, please uh, register if you'd like to ask any questions about the fire alerts. Um, you can register um, with the link provided. So thank you all for joining. Um, and with that, we will end our webinar. Thank you, goodbye.